Good evening and welcome to the second half of the Parks King Lecture for 2021. We were treated to a most uh, informative and challenging lecture by Professor Barbara Savage. And we'd like now to give people the opportunity to pose questions. So thank you again, Professor Savage, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the first question is actually from somebody both of us know reasonably well, but the question is, where does the model of Howard Terman fit into your framework? Uh, thank you uh, for that question, Jerry Streets. Nice to, to have this kind of uh, connection with you and the best of your family. Uh, if we were in a different format, I'd ask you how your golf game is, is doing, uh, maybe not that well in the winter. Um, but it's interesting that you should raise a Howard Thurman up. I don't really spend a lot of time on Thurman in the book, but as, I mean, the question that has me thinking about how much the work that he did, especially in San Francisco and the church that he and his wife established there, Sue Bailey Thurman, uh, really resonates with some of what I'm beginning to think about as this moment of uh, progressive religious revival, which is the term that I'm playing around with, which is this notion of kind of a multi-faith, multi-racial uh, spirituality um, that Thurman himself uh, established in that church and certainly that came out of his own work. I think one of the really interesting things about Thurman is the way that he kind of keeps popping up in unusual places one of the people who quoted him recently or in the last month or so, I think was AOC, as we call her, um, who is a person herself of, of, of deep faith uh, out of her Catholic uh, roots, but she often has relied on his writings as a, as a foundation of her own strength. So I think that the question actually enables me to begin thinking more about how his vision in some ways may also now being realized or realizable through some of the work that's being done in Black Lives Matter and in other spaces where spirituality uh, is deeply embedded, but not tethered so closely to very traditional notions of, of Christianity, although Christianity of course is included. So I really appreciate that question and I'll try to think a little bit more about that and uh, I really appreciate your, your bringing Thurman into this, into this conversation. That's always a good thing. So thank you. So, so Jerry followed up. Of course he did. We <laughs> uh, <laughs> would not expect otherwise. Uh, but it, and it makes, it's a great follow-up question. He is asking what might be some of the post-pandemic characteristics of Black churches? Yeah, that's, that's going to be really interesting to see because... Um, I think in a lot of complicated ways. So is there going to be a fear that people who've gotten accustomed to being able to go to church at 10 o'clock in their bathrobes and pajamas in front of their screen, are those people going to pull themselves eventually together and, and, and show up in churches? I think they will. I think we've all very much missed um, lived community that we can only get that way. So that's one, I think that's one real question about attendance, but the other one has to do with technology and how even churches who were, that were not technologically, uh, participating technologically in, in the ways that they are now have really learned what it is to have a service go virtual and attract a number of people that exceed the numbers in the congregation. And so I think we'll see a really fascinating mixture of, of um, technology with traditional forms of, of worship. And I think that that's a good thing for people who for whatever reason either are, are unable to, uh, to show up at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock uh, every Sunday. So I think it's been a period of great creativity, at least as I kind of sample around various churches and see how they're doing their Zoom services. Uh, it's possible to go to two or three, four different churches uh, in the same morning if you're patient enough, or to go to church on you know Wednesday, you know in the middle of the day. And so I think um, I think it's going to be I think it's a good thing uh, in that way. And so we'll see what comes, you know, what comes from that. But that's a really, that'll be, that'll be interesting to see. 
it will. So I want to remind our viewers, please don't be shy about uh, posing a question and you do that simply by typing your question in using the Q&A symbol. Just uh, tap that and we'll receive your question. So the next question is something you alluded to in one of your answers. Um, and you, at the end of your lecture, you also talked about this, the progressive voice. And I will ask this from a Christian standpoint, but you can answer it however you'd like. You, you pointed out that it can be broader, it can be interfaith. Um, but for many years, the far right has had the microphone in their hand and have dominated uh, the media. There have been a number of reactions, especially in the last year. So do you see not only uh, what's happening on the ground as a groundswell of a progressive movement, but do you see this as being a much more articulate voice in American politics as well? I think there's a possibility for that. I mean, I, I do think we're in that moment. And so we will see what will be realized. Um, but if every now and then we have discussions about a religious left. Is there a religious left? Where is the religious left? Uh, which seems to have been existing in fairly narrowed spaces in terms of public attention and public notice. And so you mentioned the far right and the kind of attention that it's received. Uh, in the media, part of that's because the far right has a very sophisticated media campaign and you know, apparatus themselves and a particularly well-funded one. And so that also has made it um, you know, difficult for competing religious voices to be seen, to be seen that. And we've certainly seen that for at least the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, it's not something that just developed uh, overnight in terms of the, the kind of media presence, but I'm hopeful that the presence of religious people or people of faith or people of spirituality who are at the forefront of some of the most progressive and important movements in the, in the country and in the world right now, um, that that might actually uh, kind of uh, in its own way revive among people the idea that religion and spiritual thinking can undergird that kind of political work. And I think that it's been there for a while. I think it's difficult uh, that it, it requires people being willing and able to understand and accept that this may not look like, it's not looking like the civil rights movement. It's not looking like what we think of when we think of, you know, of religion. Um, we were talking about uh, Reverend Warnock. I mean, the other uh, pr uh, pastor preacher who's in the, in the Congress is Corey Bush from St. Louis, who we forget is, or, who, but people, tend to forget is also an ordained pastor herself. And as progressive in terms of politics as we're, you know, as we're going to see, she's now an official member of the so-called squad. And so I think that it's just a reminder that there's all of this religious diversity uh, among black people and certainly even uh, among Christians in general and outside of that faith tradition and yet we tend to see stereotypical depictions uh, so often uh, in the media itself. So, uh, you know, so this is a moment of, of, uh, of learning and opportunity. And in part, as I said in the, in the talk, because there's so much religious diversity on display in the White House and in the upper levels of the administration and people who are willing and able like President Biden to talk about their faith and their politics and their sense of mission as being entwined. And so, you know, that, so there's a possibility of a different kind of conversation or widened conversation on, on religion. So let, let me follow that up by asking specifically about Reverend Raphael Warnock, whom you just mentioned and certainly discussed in your lecture. Uh, he ran explicitly as the Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock. Yes, he did. Uh, as the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. So do you see this as a one-off, as somebody who is a very talented individual and a progressive voice being embraced by a, a pretty, pretty blue state? Uh, and um, 
or do you do you think he is part of a broader trend that might take shape? I think part of part of it is actually regional. That when you live in Georgia, which is a state where uh, at least sort of public acknowledgement of religion is uh, is not uncommon that it would actually being a reverend and being a black reverend would cut, would do all, all sorts of work for you. That therefore it certainly identifies him with, um, with black religious people. And, uh, and so that's one thing, but it also would do a certain kind of work with white people in Georgia uh, who would be either could be reassured by that or feel some sense of commonality or some sense of recognition and so I thought it was a really um, interesting deployment of the of the title, and I and I take it sincere, sincerely. I'm a really big fan uh, of him and of his work and his work, his political work, his theological work. Um, I've had an occasion to see him preach, and so I was actually reassured to see that open embrace, and that that really became a central part of how he was presenting himself because that is in fact who he is and it's where his politics and his, and his public service uh, comes from. So I don't know if we'll see, um, see it more widespread than that, but I think it does show that it can be done uh, and that it's, and it's actually a, a, a very honest and open way to present oneself uh, to a political public. Yeah, no, I, I, I've wondered the same thing living in New England, if this would work quite the same way in a New England state or even in Pennsylvania. Uh, exactly. Speaking of uh, Pennsylvania, I, as I said, Georgia is, uh, in, you know, is, is, I think it's still assumed to be a part of the Bible Belt, if that's such a concept. But I think it, it's a particular kind of language that would have meaning there. And I think he was able to, uh, you know, to rely on that. So one of the challenges that anybody who's involved with religion and politics both is the question of when politics controls religion and when does religion inform politics and when politics begins to control religion the results can be disastrous uh, and we can point to lots of examples of that around the world and here in our own country. And I, I, for one, would at least say that January 6th was a classic example of that in the United States of America. How do you guard? I mean, in, we have traditionally in America tried to make a pretty hard and fast line between church and state. Uh, so how do you uh, see the use of religion in a positive way without stepping over the line and allowing itself to become a tool of the state or of politics in ways that can be quite catastrophic. Yes, that's certainly been a central debate over the last couple of decades uh, if, and more uh, here in, in this country. And I, I guess I, what I would say when I, when I think about politics and religion, I, of course, I think about electoral politics and, I, and, and, uh, and the state there and in that context. But I also think more broadly about politics and the ways that is exercised outside of electoral politics, including community organizing and, and the day-to-day -day work of people of faith uh, who are trying to live out their social commitments towards one another and what I would think of as, as, politi as political uh, actions. I think the real danger comes from uh, state sanctioning of particular religions or particular policies, uh, one, one as opposed to the other or over the other or some hierarchy of beliefs or the notion that there is a single, you know, that there is a single way when we talk about, um, uh, talk about religion. And that certainly was at the heart of, you know, old debates about a prayer in public schools, which is that, you know, prayer in public schools is an interesting issue because if everybody who's sitting in the classroom is a Christian, then you, and you're talking about prayer, you're actually talking about Christian prayer in schools. Suppose you have a classroom that has 
as we do today, you know, that are filled with students from around the world in many faith traditions or no faith tradition, which I think is a, a really stark reminder um, that religious diversity is, you know, requires us to be extremely sensitive about any kind of sanctioning of a particular uh, religion. And I say that as someone who's a, practice, a practicing uh, Christian. So um, that's the real, the real tender uh, point. I think the, it, I think the, I think religion and politics can be uneasy bedfellows, if that's a mixing many metaphors to say that. But, and but I think we've certainly seen with the religious right over the over the last number of decades um, how effectively religion can be deployed politically, um, just as it was deployed politically uh, in a very different way during the civil rights movement. And so um, I think that's, that's a pattern that will not go away and we may see other manifestations of it, which is why I, I really like, enjoy talking about um, spirituality in the Black Lives Matter movement, which to me is a continuation of, of some of those um, tensions and ideas. Some have said that the only real answer to this dilemma is secularism. That is that, that politics must be secular and let religion stay out of it. And that's the way that you protect this. So uh, I think most, I think most divisions between secular and sacred are really porous and really difficult to define and certainly difficult to, um, to maintain because people arrive in whatever positions of authority they may be in and they bring with them whatever they are. And that is an identity that's, that rests on a variety of, of factors, including religion or no religion or, or whatever. So it's actually pretty difficult to do that, to exclude, which is why I think there just needs to be a, 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 you know, a fair amount of t attention to how to balance those uh, interests and those needs in, um, you know, in, in public spaces. So uh, let me go in a, a different direction now. Um, <clears throat> in American society, we're quite aware of the decline of established churches. Uh, there's a movement more towards the type of spirituality that you've talked about in Black Lives Matter, as opposed to mm -hmm. institutional forms of churches. Um, the Black church has, has actually done better than their, their white counterparts, I think, numerically. <clears throat> um, do you have any ideas about or want to think about the future of the Black church as a force in Christianity and as a force in American society? I mean, you were, your lecture was headed in this direction. So, uh, but both within Christianity understood how heterogeneous it is Mm -hmm. uh, but then in the larger world of American culture. Well, I think one of the most interesting things in the 21st century, which is what we, we're kind of uh, crawling our way through here in the first couple of decades, is the persistence uh, of African-American religious uh, institutions and religious faith and religious people. And even as the manifestations of that are, are differ and have shifted and changed with the times, I think it's still, I think that the place of black churches in communities is still in many places a force to be, to be reckoned with, or is still a place that black people assemble for religious reasons and also for, for reasons of community and for the opportunity to be in a black institution. I mean, I argued in the book that part of the strength of black churches over the 20th century was actually came from the dearth or the absence of other black institutions. And what I see in the 21st century is the evolution of other institutions, especially grassroots local uh, institutions that are directed at either um, electoral politics or day-to-day -day issues that people are, uh, you know, need uh, need addressing, and so, I so where we're looking for black churches and black religiosity and Christianity may have shifted some and will continue to shift, 
but I think the, the importance and the presence of religious faith and spirituality is still a factor to be, uh, you know, to be dealt with. Uh, one of the things which I, I didn't mention in the talk is that I've been asked to be involved in a project that's run from the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab at Brandeis, which is what it sounds like an, uh, an initiative that is designed to um, both highlight and embrace and also to provide support for the many people who serve in, ch in, in the role of chaplains, whether in healthcare or the military or in education or a variety of, of other settings. So that when I was talking about the invisible institution, the ways in which black churches um, have sort of tried to respond to the COVID crisis, both in testing and now, as I said, my church is actually serving as a vaccination site, um, that we also you know, can see um, that the work of chaplaincy, which is often invisible to us, and I think especially in hospital and medical settings where the heroic work goes on. I mean, that we think so much about the doctors and nurses who are uh, at bedside or trying to tend to people, but the chaplains are doing that. And then they're also trying to, to tend to the healthcare providers themselves who've been really weighed down by the loss and the grief. So I think that we'll see many different sites of, of and uses for faith as a part of community and community building and maintenance, but it may not necessarily look like the mortar and, and brick churches that we're used to. One of the groups that you mentioned, uh, you mentioned this um, explicitly when you were talking about Barack Obama's political base was the importance of black women and their role in his campaign and also in black churches. Um, since, in, I mean, one of the things that has developed in, is the presence of womanist theology. Yes. Uh, and uh, you know one of the members of our faculty, I think reasonably well, Professor mm -hmm. Ebony Marshall Terman, who yes. is a chief example of this. Uh, can you say anything about how you see the contributions of womanist theology in, as it is beginning to have an impact on black churches or is it having an impact on black churches? <clears throat> we can certainly see it in American society. We now have a Madam Vice President. <laughs> uh, so, which is yes. a really healthy yep. thing. All right, I'll be happy to, to say a little bit about that. And there's a whole bunch of Q and A's here that have popped up actually. Uh, the first question is, what about the role of music? Uh, and there's a reference in particular to the work of Kelly Brown Douglas and the blues, and of course, the spirituals in black religious history. So could you yeah. comment on that? Yes, um, and thank you for that, Cynthia. I'm seeing familiar names uh, kind of pop up here. I think that, I mean, the healing power of music and certainly music is at the center for me of my own kind of religious life growing up in black churches and being in one now. And it's actually one of the things that I miss most about not being able to go to church right now is live music. I mean, I have a house full of music and I can pull out a CD, but live performances uh, are the thing that I really, really miss. Um, so I think the role of music in in healing traditions more generally. And we see that in Black Lives Matter and in some other sites as well, but it really is at the center of, um, and I think a potentially unifying uh, medium as well. So I'll think more about that and I'll try to, to think about it as I, as I begin to play with some of the ideas that I lined out here, but that's a really, uh, really uh, great question. So the next question is from somebody you also know, I think. In fact, yes. I know you do. Tisa My very Williams. small but, yeah. but growing uh, fan club, yes. <laughs> um, Tisa asks, asks about the fact that you talked about Black Lives Matter becoming uh, an open and inclusive religious uh, or having that ethos. Will that, will Black Lives Matter 
become more connected with black churches? Well, I think one of the things, and thank you for that question. One of the things I think is, has also been invisible is that black religious leaders have been involved in Black Lives Matter from the very beginning. I mean, they're there, you can see them literally on the front lines in Ferguson and everywhere else that people go, even though there's been a concerted attempt to, to cast Black Lives Matter as not only being irreligious, but anti-religious. And I think that's part of what, why I was trying to lift that up you know, in the, in the talk. I think when we talk about black churches in the years to come, really what we're talking about is black church people in the years to come. And to the extent that many of the folks I know who, were, who have been involved in Black Lives Matter were raised in black religious settings, but also felt um, at odds with, rejected by, put out from, and otherwise uh, not welcomed that to the extent that Black Lives Matter and other spaces create more open and inclusive uh, settings, that I think that the lines between uh, and the ways that we talk about Black religious people um, will shift and change uh, over time. And, and I think that that's, um, that'll be very interesting uh, to see, especially considering how many millions of people uh, really responded over the summer to um, you know, to the the uh, marches and the ways in which those marches, at least to me, really were like seas of of faith moving, and I mean faith, not necessarily religious, but faith in the future and, and the idea and the hope that by congregating and moving in unison, that we could express ourselves and our grief and our anger, and push for the kind of reform that we all want to see. So things may be reconfiguring in front of our, our eyes, I hope. So we have two more questions. Um, one is proposed by Professor Chloe Starr, who is a specialist in world Christianity. Mm. And she's asking you to expand a little bit more about Black Lives Matter and the spirituality of Black Lives Matter. Um, and here's her question, uh, can progressive Christians use that language to bring less convinced white evangelical Christians closer to the movement? Hmm. Not an expert on white evangelical uh, Christians. So that's a little bit outside of my, uh, you know, my bailiwick here. Um, but I would think that that actually depends on them and it depends on how willing they are to embrace not necessarily spirituality. There's no reason for them to sort of shed their own religious ethos or religious beliefs. The broader question is, are they willing to em embrace the politics of Black Lives Matter, whatever they bring with them to that, and they can bring their evangelical beliefs with them to that if they are also willing and able and open uh, to the kind of work that uh, Black Lives Matter is doing. And I'll say that the work that, that Reverend Barber has been doing in North Carolina is, um, is multi-faith, not faith. It's, it's very, it's interracial, multiracial, it's labor. And, and basically come if you will, if you believe in this agenda and these things that we're advocating for. And for him there, it's, it has to do with fighting voter uh, repression uh, and um, cuts in education, you know, all of the kind of social programs that I think are most helpful to people in need. And if you can agree on that, come in with whoever you are and whatever your be beliefs are, but can we unite around a common um, a political agenda in a way that's accepting and inclusive? And also I think with Black Lives Matter, embrace a model of leadership that's radically inclusive and radically flat in terms of hierarchy. So it's a whole new way of thinking about leadership and, and the, the kind of grassroots work that needs to be done. So, and so people have to be willing to kind of go there too and to really think about power where it rests and also how much power we have within ourselves as individuals to join one another and do some of this work together. So we'll give the last question to the first questioner, <laughs> Reverend Jerry Streets. Uh, 
he, he asked this question, is Warnock's new role a continuation of the pastor politician role demonstrated by Adam Powell or something different? And might those who are women and clergy in politics not be given the same status as their male counterparts? Aha, uh -huh. wait, uh, okay. So almost two questions there. Yeah. So how do you assess Reverend Raphael Warnock vis-a-vis okay. -vis Adam Powell, and secondly, women and clergy in politics, can, can they be given the same role? Yes, yeah, because if we, uh, if we actually kind of create all, of, in the creation of room for uh, leadership to come from established, from preachers essentially, then are we, basically foreclosing that route for, especially in denominations where uh, women in pastoral leadership is not as common or protect, perhaps even uh, as accepted. And that's a really uh, sort of an interesting uh, question. I think there's a way in which uh, Warnock's election and his decision to keep his pastorate in, 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 in Atlanta is, a, is, a, is a, I think a really powerful modeling of how one can, can wear one's faith in and out of a pulpit that you can take it to Ebenezer, but you can also take it to uh, the floor of the Senate. You can take it to jail because he's been uh, you know, uh, jailed for his own beliefs. And so you can wear that and, and bring it uh, in, wherever you are. And I think that to me, that's really part of what is so appealing about him is the is the integrity, meaning exactly that, the way he has integrated into one person, the coexistence of his faith and his politics. And then that's a, you know, I think that that's a lesson, you know, for all of us. So it'll be very interesting to see what kind of Senator he becomes. I think he can be a very powerful one. Adam Clayton Powell uh, is, a, is an interesting uh, uh, figure in part because he was such a politician. And I often say that what's interesting when we see people move into political office is we watched or I watched to see if they can continue to hold on to their notions of public service without becoming career politicians. And I don't mean career politicians in terms of longevity. I just mean where there's a shift in your own sense and your own recognition. And I think the thing that's reassuring about Warnock and any number of other people that we've mentioned here uh, who are in politics, but who also are people of faith, is the way in which their faith grounds and, and, and re-reminds them of why they're in those offices. And that should be to serve the people who sent them there. And so that's a wandering uh, answer, I suppose. But I really, you know, I re really look forward um, to seeing that. Uh, Powell is a, was a much more flamboyant uh, figure, and I use that with admiration. That's not a pejorative term, and he is often the term that you know the, the person who is, you know, is is kind of um, uh, kind of brought to mind when we think about these combined uh, positions. So you know, we'll see, we'll see. Well, Professor Savage, you have been exemplary in giving direct and informed answers to a large number of questions. And we're very grateful to you for your career, for what you've done and, and the work that you've done uh, throughout your career and the way you've helped to advance our understanding of black churches, of religion, of politics uh, in a very broad way and for your generosity in preparing a very fine lecture and in answering all of these questions tonight. So on behalf of everyone, we say a very hearty and heartfelt yeah. thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks to everybody who listened and who, um, you know, who had questions, some of which I could answer, some of which I could not, but it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have this exchange and it's always a privilege you know, to do this work and as I said at the, the, the start of the talk, uh, the, the, the Divinity School was a really important part of my time at Yale, it helped sustain me uh, in addition to the pulpit at Battelle where I had a chance certainly to see many of your, of your faculty 
And as I said before we started, where I also was privileged to be on the search committee that brought Jerry Streets to, uh, to that position uh, at Yale. So um, it feels like old home week and I'm glad to, glad to have been able to do it. Well, I hope that we can actually bring you back to Marquand sometime. I'd enjoy and, that. Yeah. And, then, and then instead of just saying goodbye virtually now, go have a really nice dinner together. Yes. But, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful space. And I, I always remember it as being filled with a certain cast of light as well. So um, good health to everybody there. And thank you for this opportunity. And I look forward to seeing you uh, in the flesh at some point and to, to seeing some other folks there as well. Thank so, you so thank much, you. Professor Sam. All right. Good night. Good night. Yep. Bye-bye.